welcome to the Industry Angel Podcast. We hear from the best business minds across the globe, entrepreneurs, social influencers, marketing mavens, and sales rock stars. We've got them all. Here comes your weekly dose of inspiration with your host, Ian Farah. Welcome to episode 94 of the Industry Angel. I had some fantastic and heartwarming feedback from last week's show with Owen from World Health Heroes. It gives me a huge lift to receive your messages. For example, Julie Pilcher emailed to say that she listens during dog walks as she's trying to be more productive. She's really loving the show and it helps as this journey we are on can be lonely and daunting at times. Well, yes, Julie, it can. And Julie said these shows help help Prove that that's normal. Well, it is, Julie. Don't worry about it. We're all in the same boat. And Julie's actually going to reach out to Owen as she could relate to everything he said and she has first-hand experience. So thanks for sharing that, Julie. And you guys, too, can get in touch. Please do host at industryangel.com. I get to see every email. So jump on the website. All the social links are there, too. Now, this week, we're on location and I had the privilege of meeting with two extremely inspiring gentlemen. Today we have neurobiologist, easy for you to say, Ian, from Cape Town University. Welcome to the show, Laurie Rock. Hi. Hi, Laurie. Thanks for joining us today. So we are at Pop-Up Gym in Gateshead, but that's a little bit further afield for you. So do you want to tell us a little bit about where you've come from, why you're here? Well, I've, I've been to Newcastle a few times. I'm, I'm a researcher, as, as, um, as Ian mentioned. I'm a neurobiologist of exercise science and sports medicine, and I do some, um, you know, I, I come over here about maybe once a year to do collaborative research with Northumbria University, so I know this this part of the world quite well. In fact, this is about my, I think my eighth trip to Newcastle, um, but yeah, my, my, um, my biggest interest is autonomic nervous system and the brain-body state, like sort of to do with mental performance and staying composed under pressure. So my question to you, Laurie, is you're a neurobiologist. It's really difficult to say that, by the way. Have you always done that? No, interestingly, before that, I was just doing straightforward sports science. I was an elite athlete. I did triathlon. And I was hoping to represent my country in triathlon one day. So I was really training very hard. And then actually just doing quite well in races. I was progressing amazingly well. And then I had a very bad accident and had a container truck drove into the back of me so then after that I changed my my research um, focus obviously after like four years of rehab coming back from that accident um, and yeah so it just it's it taught me a heck of a lot my own healing and I think that's sort of what what really drove my my, my research afterwards when was that or if you don't mind asking were you in your 20s uh, or? I was no I was I was just turned 30 so uh, I was, it was in, in, in the 90s, and I was very sort of um, caught up in doing the, the Ironman event, mm-hmm. the, the one they got in Hawaii. And uh, Mark Allen was my hero. Absolutely, he won six Ironmans, and he was like 38 or 36, whatever, anyway. Yeah. Won his last one. So, well, yeah, I'm 30, so I've, I've got the, you know, the right, I'm still on the, on the right side of 30. And I've got, really, I'm quite powerful, but um, I'm, I'm better at long distance. I can go for a long time. I'm not that quick in the shorter distances. So I thought, no, this is my time now. I'm turning 30, so before I get you know, too old, I'm going to go for this. So, yeah, I wanted to be a, a triathlete. And then, as I say, I trained, and I was on the road. I was cycling out to up, up our east coast to a, a town called Amanus. And then I slept over, the next day I cycled back, and it's about 150 kilometers. So in miles, I guess just under 100 miles it was, to up to one way, and then the next day I cycled back. And uh, it's on the way back, uh, I was just minding my own business. In the, We've got a yellow line on the side of the road, which is you know, where the cars can pull over. So I was cycling in this yellow, yellow line, and there's two lanes of traffic, and this big container truck came from the back, and he was completely drunk, and he didn't know what he was doing. Apparently he zigzagged all over the road and he's going probably close to about 60 mile an hour. And I was probably pedaling on at maybe whatever, 15 mile an hour. 
and when this chuck connect me at the back i mean the first injury i sustained was whiplash so i was going totally along at 15 miles an hour my body was pushed in at immediately up to 60 miles an hour my neck just whipped back i broke my neck at c3 and c c7 um and then the, the chuck connected my leg and it pushed me into the handlebars with such force that i fractured six ribs and that six ribs then, then ripped my lung and my diaphragm so i lost like half my body blood and impact and then i went over the handlebars so the, the ribs was fractured on the handlebars as i went forward some sort over the handlebars and i fell on my head i didn't have a helmet on because i was worried about the sweat pouring to my eyes so i was without a helmet and i got a very severe traumatic brain injury and then i fell on my back as well and i fractured three vertebrae my back as well and then i surfed in a tar tarmac for about 30 meters so i lost all my skin in my back and flesh was ripped out wow and i got yeah sort of ended up 33 meters from the point of impact lying at the side of the road there next to my bike and yeah it was a miracle because there was a guy that saw it happening and he phoned immediately phoned the police and they phoned the ambulance there's an ambulance on the way back to the hospital and it was amazing because they got there in six minutes and the thing is when this chuck hit me and i broke my neck so i actually broke my neck and my, it shut my breathing response down so i wasn't able to breathe so if i was lying there for longer than 15 minutes i would have been stone dead but because the ambulance got there in six minutes they gave me oxygen in six minutes so i was able to you know get to the hospital and when i got to the hospital my glasgow coma scale was down at six which is um you know it's it's a, a scale that goes from three when you're not moving at all you're dead basically or ve- in vegetative state mm-hmm. to 15 when you're, no- you're moving normally everything is all your responses are normal so if you eight means you're in a in a comatose state anything okay. below eight is comatose state so i was at six i was at the borderline of not coming back because people at five don't, don't normally come back mm. six you can still like maybe 70 percent of people still come back from that but it was touch and go and uh, yeah so it was a long road back i mean with, with the broken neck i couldn't move a single muscle so for a whole month i was just completely paralyzed they put bolts in my head that i was completely memory loss i got no recollection whatsoever from two days before the accident until 33 days after the accident it's all completely out of my mind i've got no recollections in my brain still now laurie still now it's all completely gone I mean, uh, so I was in a coma for five days. Mm-hmm. And after that, after five days, I came out of the coma. And based on that, they say if you're in a coma for one day, it's termed severe brain injury. So it's a traumatic brain injury, TBI. So mine is termed very severe because it was five days traumatic, five days in a coma. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they also then eventually when I woke up, they saw I wasn't moving a muscle. So they said, well, it's probably got spinal injury as well. And I went for scans, and I said, "Yeah, I've got a broken neck." Then they put me in the in these um, bolts in my head with weights at the back, mm. so I was completely immobile. And they said I had to lie immobile for basically 12 weeks for the you know for the spine to heal first. But apart from that, I couldn't move a single muscle for a whole month. The first time I could move my muscle was I remember it's my sister's birthday, the April Fool's Day, first of April, when I could move the tips of my fingers. My accident was on the 2nd of March, so it was virtually a whole month. I wow. was completely immobile. And then for another whole month, I could hardly move. I, mean, I was basically trying to make a fist. It took me four months to make a fist in my, my left hand, and then about six or seven months to make a fist in my right hand. And, uh, yeah, so you can imagine all the muscle lost. I mean, I was just lying practically immobile for about six months. And uh, when I tried to then, you know, get my life back again, you know, to try and get up and walk it was a long process for instance things like you know they started off with my fingers i had to move my fingers individually because i got a neck spinal cord it's very high up injury mm-hmm. i could only move all my fingers together so i had to teach me virtually to move each finger separately and i had to do every morning i had to do like a hundred i tape my fingers together except for one finger so i okay, lift one finger and it was just doing that for an hour it was probably more strenuous than doing a, a triathlon, a full triathlon. Oh. It was just the amount of effort involved to try yeah. and just move your finger. So, so mentally, I was, it was completely a freak out because if it's so, so hard just to move a finger, yeah. I was thinking, how am I ever going to walk again? So it was like my just a complete yeah, 
and what drove me in the beginning was this guy that drove into me because he was a drunk driver yeah. and it's completely his fault he beat me from the back mm -hmm. so I was just so angry at this man for you know for driving into me yeah so I was blaming him for everything and it was good in the beginning because it gave me the anger to actually like say I'm you know every time I did a workout I was thinking of smashing his face mm -hmm. but then eventually it's like it becomes that anger becomes so counterproductive because now it, you can't do something on anger all the time because it affects you inside okay so i had to get back into a state where i could actually like manage my my recovery and um as i said i was a, a, a very sort of physical before i mean i did ironman oh, sorry i mean triathlon i did rock climbing i did hiking up the mountain you know five day hikes barefoot i mean i was just pushing myself to limit all the time hmm. And that's where I tapped into, you know, when I started walking, that was to me like the make or break because I thought the longer I sit in this chair, the more backward I'm going to go. You know, just my muscle is not going to yeah. recover more. I mean, obviously, I, I, I've got a brain injury. I've got a spinal injury. So I try and move from the brain. I try and move my body. But if the brain is injured, then I try and get, you know, from the brain to the muscle. But you've got to go through your spinal cord and the spinal cord is damaged. And they only got the one leg. So there's so many injuries to consider. And it just, nothing worked. You know, it was just, I, I wasn't getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. I've the first six months I'd improved so I could move, make the fist in both hands. Mm -hmm. But then it was like, I, I couldn't progress. I was just not going anywhere. And I thought, no, this this reminds me of some, you know, some times I'd spent in the mountain, particularly when I'm in a, in a very bad position when about to fall and you just got to get that mindset right to say that keep climbing or when you just you know at at the point of a race where you can win it if you just you know you just get in that right state where you can just go for it put everything into it and i knew it comes down to having the goal a very clear goal in your mind of what you want to do what you want to achieve and i think the most powerful example before that was the part of winning races was great, but the one thing that stood out was when I was rock climbing, and it was actually a bit silly because I went with a friend. We were messing around, and I was very high up, about 100 meters up, and I was just bouldering, well, not just climbing up without ropes. And unbeknownst to myself, when there was a ledge, and I climbed too far to the one side, so and I ran out of handholds, and I looked down. It's about a 100 meter drop. You know, it was just. It was just like a freak out because now I couldn't I couldn't climb up I couldn't climb down I couldn't jump down to the ledge either, and then when I looked down I I saw how far I was about to fall then I started shaking, and I started sweating because now it's like because it's just like life or death this what am I gonna do, and I realized that was the two worst things to do is to start shaking when you hanging on for like <laughs> pimples in the rock face, and if you start sweating you're gonna start slipping so it was like. My whole life flashed for my face. But the one thing that sort of, you know, what got me back to reality is was I was thinking my mom, because she always said, don't do this thing because you're going to get injured. She always warned me not to do stupid things. I just saw her face, like, hearing I died in the mountains. It's like, no, I couldn't do this to her. And I, I just realized and I had to make up my mind immediately. Either I climb down or I climb up. There's only two things I can do. And I saw I can't climb down because I can't see where I'm going and the only way I can do it is climb up and I, my friend had already gone to the next ledge he sort of let, he sort of chimneyed up the, the, the side there so he's in the next ledge and he said no you can't climb up because no handholds yeah but in my mind I knew I could do it because not could I, the only way I could do it was to climb up because I couldn't climb down and when I made my mind up to climb it was as if like it's just a shift in my whole body it was just I immediately stopped shaking immediately stopped sweating and it's just as if I had this power in my body. It almost felt like I was Superman or Spider-Man. And I was just climbing. And normally when you climb, you've got to think, you know, mm. can I get to that ledge? But it was just, I was no thought involved. So that was the one key was like no thought and trust your body. And I was just in the zone. And I climbed up that mountain like a, basically like Spider-Man. My friend at the top, and he saw this, <laughs> he, he said, how did you climb up here? He was just amazed. He said, you yeah. shouldn't be able to do that. But it's just that memory of having that absolute power of just climbing and doing it completely without thought and completely in your body. So that, that's what I tapped into when I was now learning to walk. And I had a brain injury, a spinal cord injury, one leg, 
my, you know, if I cut my leg off by that stage, obviously, and it's, the stump was just flapping around. There's no muscle in the stump, no abductors, no adductors. My core muscles were shot to pieces. I couldn't brace myself. I could, in the parallel bars, I could hold myself up in my hands. But as soon as I took one step on this leg, I just, everything would just crumple. My leg would just fold in on myself, and it's, my other leg was also very weak. I mean, the most I could do was 180 seconds was the longest I could last in this one leg. Stand on my one leg for 180 seconds. Mm. So that's all I had, this 180 seconds on one leg. That's basically all the muscles I had. So I knew the only way I could walk was to tap into my previous experiences. And that's what I did. And the first thing I knew, I had to relax my body. Just be completely relaxed. Because if you think about walking, you're going to be so stressed, you're going to fall. And the only way I could do that was to start laughing about it. I mean, I was 30 years old. It's the carpeted floor. And yeah, I'm scared to fall. You know, it's pathetic. You know, just get on with it. But obviously, to try and convince your body is another matter. Mm-hmm. So I had to really, like, buy into laughing. So I did. I started laughing. But then I'd take one step and I'd fall. And everybody would, like, look around. They all start laughing. So I'd just repeat that. I'd take one step and I'd fall. So I guess I've now... I've actually managed to convince myself to walk out of this parallel bars, which I thought I'd never be able to do because I was too panicked. But because I was laughing, I could take the step. I said, but this is okay, one good thing, but there's something else that's needed. There's no point, you know, you're just falling all the time. You're not teaching yourself to, how to walk. And then I realized what I was actually trying to do, what I was actually doing, I was trying not to fall. And that was what was wrong. It was like the same on the rock face. Am I climbing up or climbing down? You can't split your brain. Yeah. I wanted to walk, not I'm scared of falling. So that's what I had to put out of my mind, is not to be scared of falling and not to think of falling. Just think of walking. But then I didn't know what it is to think of walking because I'd never in my life thought of walking. And you just walk. So I, again, like in the rock face, trust your body. So my body, you're going to walk. And I'm going to just keep quiet up here. I'm not going to think anything. And I'm going to be relaxed. And it was, it was amazing. It's, it's like a switch, it's like throwing a switch. It's almost like starting to fly. It's like I've learned how to fly. I'm walking. I literally walked for about 10 paces. But then what happened, everybody stopped. The whole physio big room, they all stopped to look at me. Cause they all <laughs> saw me like this guy can never walk. I mean, he shouldn't be able to. And they saw me walking. And when I picked up, they were watching me. And immediately, I just fell immediately because now I'm distracted. Like, and I can't get distracted. And it literally took me... A, but by the end of the month, I walked right around the physio room. It's a big room, and I walked down the stairs and up the stairs. It was just it was freaky. But as soon as I had one thought, I'd immediately fall. It was just as if like a sw- another switch was thrown. As soon as I thought what I was doing, because I wanted to teach myself to walk. So what am I doing to walk? But no, if I, as soon as I thought about walking, or any thought, I'd immediately fall. So, so those are the two things I took away from, from my rehab. What was quite amazing was... Relax your body and don't think. But because my body was so weak and so atrophied, it took enormous brain power that I couldn't do anything else. So I thought, no, well, this, this is what I'm going to research. Now, when I do my research, going back to, to, sports scientists, uh, to sports science. So you mentioned the two things was relax your body and don't think. But earlier on, you mentioned about um, maybe competing and you have to get yourself in that right state. And I think you kind of give the analogy of being behind somebody. I don't know if we, we spoke about it offline or not, but, you know, about being behind, where you're talking about cycling there maybe or running where you're behind somebody. And then is the right state literally that I need to get in front of that person and I need to put myself in a state to do that? Or how can the physical body react to that state? Yeah, I, th- I think in races before, it's just you've got to know what, what moment you can break, okay. break away when you know you can make it to the finish. Mm-hmm. And you know you can, based on the other guys, you know how they're performing. You can see you can probably beat them because you can see how they're cycling. Um, yeah, and it's just then you, it's just like you, it's almost like an instruction you give your body. Okay. So this is what I need to do. I need to get to the end, and it's forty kilometers away. Yeah. But you got to do it on your own, and go for it. It's almost like you just then you go into that zone where your brain now knows this is what you want to do. And I know from my research now this. What happens, you get a chemical release. Mm-hmm. And dopamine is one of the most powerful r- chemicals to do with the reward system because that works with your reward, f- the feeling good, and with your motor system. So it does the both together. And things like um, 
you know, your cortisol. I mean, it's your stress hormones, obviously, but I find to me it's the most important thing is to be relaxed. You've got to be in the zone and you've got to be relaxed because as soon as you start panicking, you're using up too much energy. Yeah. That's, that's a complete no-no. Yeah. And you also, it's also then more top-down control. So you, it's actually your brain trying to control your body, which it should be the other way around. It's like you're, when you're exercising, mm-hmm. your body knows best. So you've got to do it like a bottoms-up approach. Okay. And you've got to release the right chemicals from your brain stem. The so-called reptilian brain releases the chemicals, mm. and it, then it keeps you going to, to achieve your goal. Yeah. And it's, it's very simple. It's really interesting that um, sort of nervous energy that you feel in your head, and, and then, yes, you know, you, you are you react to that. So how can you get away from that then? I know you, you kind of number one was relax your body. Is there any techniques that you've got to, to try to stop that negative nervous kind of energy? Yeah, so the, the, the key thing is to stop thinking. Okay. And you, you go into what's called heightened awareness. Okay. So you're actually more aware of what's going on around you, mm-hmm. but you don't attach to anything. And also your body posture is very important. So that's why also your, I call it moving from the spine. Okay. Because all your motor neurons and interneurons, and everything is basically in your spine. So, I mean, they've done experiments with cats. They decerebrate the cat. They actually disconnect the brain. It's just a spinal cord. Hmm. And that cat can walk on the treadmill. And it can, they speed up the treadmill even to running speed. And the cat goes from walking you know, to running slowly to actually like full, like running full speed on the treadmill, purely on the spine. Okay. And it's, so that really is where movement is generated in your spine. And it's, it's controlled by your reptilian brain. So that's what you got to allow that that part of the movement itself. Let your body do it. Only awareness is in the tactics, you know, when you should break away or whatever, but not in, you know, or, or maybe increasing the pace and setting the goal. That's the most important. It's the thinking should just, or the awareness is what, where's the end. Okay. And that's all. This is a bit like clearing your mind then? Is clearing, but not only that, it releases the right chemicals. So, for instance, serotonin will get released from your from your brainstem, which is amazing. The serotonin will go down to your spine. It will match up your autonomic nervous system. So it'll give you enough sympathetic release. Mm. It will actually like activate your muscle without brain power. It will generate energy in the spine to, to increase your muscle force in your muscle. And it will it will match up your your um yeah your, your muscle coordination. And it's all done without thinking. But and again, if you, as soon as you start thinking. As soon as you get distracted by something else, this automatically stops because then it allows you to attend to the new input. Okay. So that, that, that's the thing with the thinking. It allows you to attend to new things, but that's going to hamper your movement then. So the key thing is not to hamper your movement by thinking. You, you just keep the moving going and you become heightenedly aware of things going on. So you take it in without thinking about it. You just take it in. Okay. And send it down to your spine. Yeah. So you stay in the moment. So you stay relaxed. Because as soon, as soon as you start thinking, you get the release of different chemicals like the cortisol and adrenaline in your brain. And then it's, it's, it's tickets, basically. Yeah. Get out, I mean, tickets for, for the zone. You, <coughs> immediately out of the zone. It's like a switch that gets turned immediately out of the zone. You know, when you say thinking, are you thinking about how would that outside influence react to me? Have, have I listened to someone shout something? Am I taking on... I don't know instruction from somewhere else. Is it just literally just shut your mind off to the to the task in hand? If you if you allow it to, yeah. Yeah. So the top athletes they won't let them get distracted, but it is yeah. It could be a guy coming past you. Yeah. You never expected it to, or there's some spectator that's now you know shoots like a, a big makes a big noise. Yeah. A radio, whatever, something screams. Yeah. It can put you off. Yeah. So that's why these top athletes they don't allow it to happen. Okay. They train all the eventualities. And if something does happen to put them off, they'll just, you know, do it in the heightened awareness. Okay. And not that, because the other thing also with the serotonin, it actually, it actually shuts off the pain response, which is quite amazing. So it shuts off the pain response, so that you don't feel as tired, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. absolutely amazing. So it was, and that's being in its own. So how can you train that? Uh, the way to train it is is you got to do slow movement to start off with. Teach yourself how to move from the spine. And you got to, your body's got to be in the optimal position as well. So, but this has not only got applicability for elite athletes. Mm-hmm. I mean, I find you can transfer this knowledge to practically anything, any task you set, whether it's 
wellness, mm -hmm. whether you've got the NCD, like maybe diabetes or obesity, high blood pressure, heart disease, all of that, it's the same thing. You need to minimize the stress in your body and minimize the thinking. Just let your body heal itself. So those principles you can use for a business project, like any, anything you, you want to get done, you just stay focused on the task and what the ultimate goal is because your brain and your body can work it out. But the key is not to panic. You set the goal, but not then not to panic and push it. Just allow it to develop and just keep keep the focus. Not that it's going to happen itself, but the, the, like when I learned to walk, it was complete, 100% relaxed focus. Yeah. It's, there's, no, there's no shortcut to this kind of thing. You just have to teach your body just to stay in that zone as long as possible and, and use your power you've got in your spine and the chemical release thinking is you know overpriced you know you can think it's good <laughs> like when you're lying down at night you can think about things yeah. but don't overthink when you're in in the thick of things okay so that's interesting so there's a time and the place to think is what we're saying there like so preparation think about preparing making lists going through scenarios but when the time comes it's you, you focus and you just shut focus all that out. and heightened awareness and don't yeah. think yeah don't think too much at all if you can help <laughs> so this is a great why because obviously that that happened to you and then i think you said you were doing sports science after that you've then kind of said right okay i'm going to look into the neurobiology side is that right absolutely so yeah. and, and so what does it look like now then laurie what's like what 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 does your day look like what is your goals well i, th I think what i've set out to do was I wanted to measure the heart and the brain together because mm -hmm. there's, there's nobody really looking at it in, in, in sort of researches and I wanted to find out because I know if my heart's in something and I do it much better mm. if, I, if I just think about doing something for instance like exercise you know you think you've got to exercise you've got to stop smoking you've got to eat healthily but it doesn't help much because it's in your brain you've got to get it into your body and your plus your heart's got to buy into it it's got to get the same message so I do a lot of brain and heart measurements and then the one sort of you know I was everything I've, I've learned in rehab like I told you the relaxed body and the quiet mind I've subsequently the next 20 years I spent doing research on that and I find exactly that is exactly like that and the final ex experiment now we just published two or three studies on it was when we we, um, we wanted to get people to do the exercise in the brain scanner so we tried cycling but it's too much movement so we had to go to hand grip exercise and then the way we motivate people then is we give them Ritalin, which is like a, it's a, it stimulates your brain. So it releases extra dopamine in your brain mm -hmm. and a bit of extra norepinephrine as well. But the, the main thing it releases is dopamine. So your dopamine is great because that works with your movement and with your reward system. So it just, all it does is you're willing to do more work. So for the same amount of effort, you get more work done because you feel you, you're more driven to do work. It's almost, it works in a similar way to cocaine, but it's a slow release. So it's just like put you on that little bit of a amped up. But the interesting thing what we did, we, we tested Ironman athletes, so people that are used to pushing themselves to the limit, mm -hmm. and we took people that are more sedentary, that don't exercise much, because we wanted to see, you know, does this Ritalin affect them differently? And the amazing thing was that in the people that exercise up to 20 hours a week, if you give them Ritalin to the hand grip exercise, now you've got to remember hand grip exercise is not really exercise. It's more it's more like a willingness to, to withstand pain because yeah. after you've gripped two times, it's like it's such build of pain and acid that you just want to stop. Sure. So it's like mind over matter. Yes. So we found that triathletes were so were so used to pushing themselves to that limit that the Ritalin didn't even help them. You know, they didn't perform better. It didn't get their heart rates up. Wow. But sedentary people, they actually got their heart rate up plus they did more work. Okay. And the less the sort of more sedentary they were, the more the Ritalin helped them. So there's actually, we got a paper out in that, so it's with, 20, with, 30 athletes, with 30 people, and it just shows that if you've done a certain amount of physical activity, the Ritalin is not going to help you anymore. So which, that means so your, your dopamine neurotransmission is normal if you exercise enough. If you don't exercise enough, your dopamine neurotransmission is suboptimal. So what that means... You've got dopamine receptors all over your brain. And that's like your reward system as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the easiest way for us to understand that is with like the obesity problem we've mm -hmm. got, the obesity epidemic is in the, in the modern society, it's like the, the movement has been removed from foraging for food. 
So that actually works together. Whenever you want food, the brain is set up so you forage for the food. Yeah. And foraging for the food, you, you require dopamine. Okay. So dopamine allows you to move and it also gives you the reward when you get the food. So it's, it's a beautiful system. But if you take the movement out of the equation and you just have the reward from the food, then what happens is your dopamine receptors actually start down-regulating. And then what happens then is you need more food to get the same reward ah, for the amount of okay. food you eat. Wow. So it's a bad vicious cycle because yeah, then the less yeah. you move to get food, the more your dopamine down-regulates. Then you need to eat more again to get the same reward. And the more overweight you are, the more difficult it is to move again. So you move even less, then your dopamine goes even down the more. So it's it's yeah it's, it's it's such a simple little system, but it's amazing we found this with the people who don't exercise they got a problem with their dopamine yeah. turnover, and once you correct that, then it's, it becomes much easier to regulate your weight as well. Mm. So that's another another positive with this kind of thing. So the studies you've done, you now put them into action. So I guess you're doing is it workshops you're doing now, and you're, you're kind of sharing this knowledge that you've found to help people. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. This, this now what I'm trying to do now is to just get the knowledge out there. Because as a scientist, you know, you've got to obviously publish the data. So I've published enough now yeah. to show my model is it, it works. Okay. So I work on the nervous system. And most people in sports science will work on either the, the muscles, you know, the repetitions, mm -hmm. you know, how far you must run, you know, all that kind of stuff. The, the, the fitness is the most important and the, the amount of time you spend doing it. But but my my thing, it, it's, it's like a, almost like an add-on which makes all those kind of things more powerful because now – I work with the nervous system and with the, the, the neurotransmitters. And if you don't put those two together, your system isn't as good as it can be. So t to me, it's like when you exercise, you've got to be in a proper state, a mental state, to maximize the benefit of the exercise. Mm. Then, it, then it becomes more of a, a rewarding experience. There's no, you don't have to push yourself, you don't have to be motivated to exercise. You get motivated while you exercise. Okay. And that's the difference. So people that don't like exercising, this is the way to exercise. And I do it with slow movement to teach the spinal cord how to move from the spine first, you know, how to get that thing right, mm -hmm. get your receptors right in your brain. And then after, you've, after they've all normalized, then it becomes such a pleasure to exercise that you, you actually have to stop people from exercising because it's – I look forward to exercise. But to me, it's like the most beautiful thing because I know I'm going to get – a nice buzz in my head. I'm going to feel beautiful afterwards. So it drives me to exercise as much as I, as I, as I, as I can. Mm. So from a, a kind of health and well-being space, but linking that with business, is this what we try to do now, to do now with people who are you know, trying to be more mindset and more mindful? Can we link this into business and sort of say, we should be looking to exercise more to give you that, that kind of release of stress that people are into now with, with, with business? Would it help that way? Absolutely, because I mean, I'm also kind of you know, as a scientist, you're also kind of a businessman. You've got to manage your, all the research activities and your sure. students. And at the end, you be, you're so busy trying to coordinate your research, you don't have any time to exercise. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I found. So, sure. I mean, and I, I used to cycle a lot with, with my disability, but I found it took too much energy. Then I got into doing stuff like qigong and more mindfulness, like mindfulness meditation. Whereas I just teach my brain how to quieten down by itself. And I do a lot. The most powerful exercise is, is, is this rhythmic movement from the spine. Okay. So in the gym, I do a lot of rhythmic movement. I don't ever tie myself in. You always got to keep your core stable. Yeah. And you, all the movement from the, from the spine. And you can even do that in your place of work. Like going for coffee, you can walk rhythmically. Mm -hmm. And just being in the zone while you're walking. So you can, even when I sit, I always sit with my back free from the back of the chair, and I always have this movement around my, my spine. So it's like you always, you can get in the zone very quickly, even while you're working in a computer. Wow. If you if you start feeling a bit dozy, yeah, yeah. you just move on your chair as you sit there, that rhythmic movement. It'll give you back that feeling. And it's, and it's so the key is not to push yourself too hard. Okay. You, 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 and it must be like you want to do the exercise to get you that good feeling yeah, yeah. and that healthy feeling brilliant feeling cool so for a businessman it's 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 amazing because you don't have to go out and pound the, the, the tarmac for like an hour or two <laughs> you literally just have to do some rhythmic movement yeah. some qigong in your office even yeah, yeah it's probably worth 
telling our listeners what you're doing here, Laurie, because obviously that, that accent's n- not a not a, a northeastern accent, so you've come up from South Africa. That's right, yeah. I've, I've came, came, I flew over on the 19th of June. We had a conference in Portsmouth. It was a NHS. It's called a Systems and Society Conference. Okay. And it's brilliant because you've got to have both sides of the coin. And like any any system, any business system, you've got obviously your, your, your systems you've got to maintain and the, and the key performance indicators, all those kind of things. But you also got the society, the people working in the inside that system. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes the people inside the system is where the, all the friction takes place because people are fighting yeah. with each other. And, and the system demands that there's key KPIs that you've got to come up with. But it's, if, you, if you think you, know, you don't agree with that system, you still have to do it. So your heart might not be in it. Yeah. You just look at it perform. And then you tend to get a lot more mental health issues. So, and this was specifically targeted at, at the NHS because now it's, the NHS is now 70 years old on the 5th of July. NHS staff? Uh, and the NHS staff as well because, I okay. mean, yeah, it's, it's just there's too many people now not looking after their own health. They're not, they're not um, looking after their own well-being and yeah. doing exercise, enough exercise. This is because the stress is so much. You have to work literally 24-7 to just stay ahead these days. There's so much competition. So that's the conference I came to. I gave a talk on well-being with my colleagues at Northumbria University. And we look at what's called heart rate variability because that's your – it's like it gives you a good record of your internal state yeah. of how healthy your cardiovascular system is. Mm-hmm. And if you're too sympathetic or if you've got enough vagal power, which you're – this is now your rest and digest system, which is the healthy system. Your you're st- fight and flight, you want to minimize and up your rest and digest system because that's more heart healthy. It's more healthy for your, your, your um, kidneys, for your blood vessels. Everything does much better on the parasympathetic system. It's almost like your recovery processes. It's like even between your heartbeats. So that's why you're going to try and slow your resting heart rate as slow as possible because... That's the only rest your heart gets. It's it's called lucidotropy. Okay. The recovery of your heart between beats. Yeah. And the other one is the inotropy, so when you increase your heart rate. Yes. You can get a lot more done, but it's very bad for your heart. So you want to try and get people out of that state, get them to the rest and digest the lucidotropy where you, your heart recovers after each beat. We're, we're talking outside of exercise here. We're just talking about resting. So yeah. trying to relax the body, bring your rest and heart rate down. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So what we did in the brain scanner, we with the heart rate, we measured the brain areas, that, which you got control over, yeah. which you can control your heart rate. Okay. But it's it's more indirect with your breathing. Yes. But it can be done mindfulness meditation. So it's okay. all just slowing your body down. Sure. And slow movement's the best way to slow your body down. Yeah. It's the easiest way to to slow yeah, everything yeah, down. Yeah. Fascinating. So that was Portsmouth. That was in Portsmouth, yeah. <laughs> and then I came. We now we're in Gateshead. Back up to to Newcastle with them. Um, yeah, with um, at the Northumbria University. Yeah, and um, yeah, I came. Um, we did some talks with with Fire and Rescue. Actually, it's down the road. Yeah, hey, it's um, where where is it based? <laughs> Laurie's looking at Richard here, so who's also sitting on the, on on the, on the interview. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> no, it's just, Richard took me to the to the Fire and Rescue, but I believe it's on this side of the river. Get get it. Is it get it? Yeah, get it. Yeah. Yeah. Tanaway Fire and Rescue. Yeah. All right, okay. So we hope you do a workshop with them also later in the week. Yeah. On you know, this composure under pressure. You know, ah, when the fire, right, okay. whatever, there's any emergency situation. Yeah. It's always good just to be, to assess the situation very quickly. Okay. You've got to be completely quiet in your brain. Yeah. Because you've got too many things happening. You can't make a snap decision, correct snap decision. Yeah. And what, do you leave them with exercises on how to do this or? Yeah, we're hoping. But what we also measure is the heart rate and the heart rate variability because from that you can see if they're in a in a composed state, and then we also do the movement training. Yeah. Okay, fascinating, excellent stuff. Is there anything you're going to leave us with, Laurie? Because I'm I'm sure people want to maybe look into this a bit more. Do you have a website, or could we get a hold of you on social media, or drop yeah, you an we're email? Actually, we're actually busy setting up a website with Northumbria University. Excellent. It's it's called Wellbeing Informatics, but at the moment I've got uh, with a friend of mine we're also setting up a business in this. Mm-hmm. It's called calm in the storm sa or one word dot com so www calm in the storm sa dot com yeah and i've just post blogs i try and post a blog every couple of months every, i actually do it every month 
on taking my science and making it more applicable to the to the layperson. Okay, so yeah. So they can understand what what the science is saying. Because sometimes it's difficult, you know, you get all these terms that people come up with, but you don't actually understand in practice what it means. Yeah. I well, know you, you've kept it quite lame, and I'm I'm glad you've done that. But uh, there's a good t- there's a good few takeaways in there. So Laurie, I really appreciate it, and thanks for your time. Great, thanks so much. Really appreciate this. So Drew, I just thought it'd be great if you could come and um, meet us because we've had Laurie here. We're at the pop up gym in Gateshead, and we've had a great conversation with Laurie. But actually, I'm pretty intrigued about your story as well. And I thought it'd be great if you could share it with our listeners. Is that okay? Absolutely, yeah. Go for your life. Yeah, well, I'll give you a quick version of it. So um, I've been pretty much an athlete my whole life. I was a track runner, cross country and track. And then 2008, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to go to a university in Colorado called Adams State University, which was kind of a big running university. It was at uh, 7,500 feet above sea level, so it was perfect for distance running. So I did that for four and a half years. had a great experience. I traveled all around America doing that. And then um, decided I was going to be a professional coach afterwards because uh, I kind of saw my coach's job and thought, wow, that looks pretty fun. <laughs> I want to do that. So I, I got a job at a university in Texas called um, Abilene Christian University. And it was a dream job. Re- it was just an absolute dream job. Um, I wasn't a big fan of Texas, but I really enjoyed the job. So, uh, so yeah, I pretty much retired from running competitively and just sort of was staying fit and doing a few things. And decided I was going to be... Um, going to try something new and I decided I was going to try an Ironman triathlon so I was training for that and I uh, I ran into a lake uh, just to go for a swim and hit a submerged sandbar that I didn't realize was there in a lake and just um, heard a loud bang and immediately just couldn't move I was drowning in about two feet of water and as it turned out when I'd hit the sandbar I'd broke my fourth vertebrae in my neck and I just instantly become paralyzed from the neck down so i uh, spent a year in hospital as an inpatient and an outpatient in denver did you dive Andrew? yeah i just i didn't dive off anything in particular i just ran in like you would like you see the triathlon athletes on tv they just run in and then just do a shallow dive when they get up sort of above the knees and i just did that and it was just um yeah unfortunate that there's this like sand shelf that i hadn't realized was there and I just yeah just heard a ringing in my ear and I couldn't really figure out what it was I thought I'd been hit by a boat or something because I just couldn't yeah, figure yeah. out why I was unable to just get up and it's only a couple of feet of water but mm-hmm. I was drowning and fortunately I got pulled out by um, my partner at the time so I was lucky that she was there and yeah I spent like I say about a year in the hospital and I got to experience amazing rehab facilities and amazing physiotherapists and Mm -hmm. all this innovative machinery especially for spinal cord injuries and um, I did as much recovering as I physically could I didn't really get that much back physically but I kind of give it my best shot so I came back to England knowing that at least I'd tried my best and I had no regrets and um, I arrived back in England in 2015 thinking you know there might not be the same facilities in a in the UK as they have in America, but I'm sure there'll be something. And then I quickly realized that there was nowhere I could exercise or do rehab or anything. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of depression and as well as depression, I was having a lot of physical issues, like a lot of spasms and extra pain and stuff. So I kind of started thinking I need to do something about this. And yeah, that's kind of initially how I came up with the idea for the gym. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I um, I did a. I went around the north and met a few people who'd had similar accidents to me, and interviewed them and tried to figure out what they'd done and what facilities they'd used, and just kept getting the same story all the time. There was just nothing in the north, or the northeast in particular, for people to to do no uh, rehab center or gym or anything for people in wheelchairs. So in about 2016, we uh, registered Pop-Up Gym as an official charity and we started doing crowdfunding and fundraising to try and get it off the ground. And it took about probably two to two and a half years of fundraising. And eventually in January, we uh, we opened our doors and um, we got a lot of specialist equipment donated and we were able to buy some of it. And we're pretty much one of a kind in the, well, in the UK as far as I'm aware. 
And that was January 2018, yeah? Yeah, we just opened, uh, yeah. Just so what, what does it look like then? So you've got how many how many people come to the, visit the gym? What, what, what kind of disabilities do they have? Or Well, the initial plan, um, it was called Pop-Up Gym because the initial plan was to take it all around the north. But then in... Um, probably about this time last year we got the opportunity to get this site here so it's not a huge place but it's uh it's big enough for what we need it for so i've got a decent sized gym here and um we've got about 35 members so far and the initial plan as well was sort of specifically for people with spinal cord injuries but then we quickly realized that it wasn't just spinal cord injury people that could yeah. benefit from our equipment there's people who've had strokes or other types of brain injuries and people ranging from MS, ME, um, motor neurons, pretty much anything that's put you in a wheelchair and has uh, resulted in some form of paralysis means that this equipment's gonna gonna work for you. So we've got a wide range of people coming in yeah. now, so it's been really good. I can see them all smile away when I came in earlier on. They're enjoying it, yeah? Yeah, it's, it's a good environment. Uh, it's going even better than I thought it would be, to be honest. When I first opened, uh -huh. on the first day, we had four people in, and right. it was pretty hectic. And I thought, yeah, this is probably the limit of uh -huh. what we can handle. And then now we're getting 15 people a yeah. day. And, you know, it's all specialized training, one on one, and all our machines are Fantastic. specifically designed for wheelchair use. We've got specialist bikes called fes bikes which stands for functional electrical stimulation right and how that works is you put pads on your muscles and then they um give you like your muscles an electric bit of electric i guess sort of an electric shock in a way and that stimulates your muscles to pedal the bike so it's actually wow. your muscles are doing the work even though yeah i can't tell my legs to move because i'm paralyzed okay the computer does it for me so it's it's the only thing the computer's doing is sending the signal and my muscles are doing the work so we've just got stuff like that which is quite specialist and innovative sure. we've got standing frames so people who are paralyzed can stand up and exercise we've got specialized weights machines so people can do it straight from the wheelchair and yeah it's just going from strength to strength it at the sounds moment. like it so what happens to, to, to gps or hospitals refer to you or and um, we're hoping to do that in the future at the minute it's just kind of word, word of, of mouth. mouth right okay. yeah and i've had a f been in the northeast times recently and we've been on bbc look north so we're still trying to get the word out as much as possible but it's starting to take off a bit the last six weeks of really um it's kind of snowballing and it's, yeah it's getting exciting now so is there a website or anything or yeah it's uh www.popupgym all one word dot org dot uk excellent stuff yeah. well what i'll do is i'll link to that in the show notes from today's conversation because i'm sure people listening to this will be interested to to see what you guys are up to it sounds amazing yeah that'd be great like i say any sort of anything that's left you in a wheelchair or even people who've had a stroke and have limited yeah. mobility can uh, benefit from the gym we're a charity so everything's subsidized only charge 20 pounds a month and you know lots of the machines there's gyms down south that kind of have the same machines as us and it might cost sort of 50 pounds an hour to, right, to right, use some hour. stuff we've got wow. so it's quite specialist stuff and we have um staff who are experienced and have a lot of expertise in working with people with neurological okay. injuries or disorders so um, yeah. yeah we're just doing it as cheaply as we can we're trying to make accessible equipment financially accessible as well and how many members was it drew it's about 35 at the minute excellent stuff well i think done. we've outgrown this place already so right. we're gonna have to expand <laughs> i think soon okay excellent well thanks so much for your time thank you very much thanks to drew for hosting us today and to laurie for sharing his experiences with us you'll probably notice i just sat back and gave laurie the space and time to share that incredible journey with you I think you know how passionate I am about mindfulness and exercise, nutrition alongside business life. And Laurie's experience empowered me to work on that relaxation and focus side a bit more. I know many of you have been through testing times and listening to both Drew and Laurie has really empowered me. And I hope it has for you as well. You know we call this the most diverse business podcast out there. And this is what I'm trying to do is give you stories and journeys from amazing people such as these two gents. So until next time, I'm Ian Farah. This is the Industry Angel. Thanks for listening.